So today we're going to be creating our miniature landscape on small four and a half by six inch watercolor paper. This is the other half of the paper that matches the size of our veil painting. And you want to make sure that this is taped down all the way around right next to the edge. That's going to give us the really nice white border whenever we peel the tape up later. So here's a sample of the painting we're going to be creating today, and it's going to teach us a lot of great, very basic watercolor painting techniques. You'll learn how to create gradient washes, how to lift color back off of your painting, and the difference between hard versus soft edges, and also a review of the foreground, middle ground, and background today. So for your supplies, you'll need your basic watercolor supplies ready to go. And the very first step is you're gonna take just a wet brush and wet the entire piece of paper. You wanna make sure that you cover everything completely and that you don't miss any spots. You'll be able to tell if you take a look at your paper from an angle and you should see the entire piece of paper with the shine of the water on it. Now, once this is wet, you're going to come over to your paint palette and we're going to start by mixing up just a nice, rich, pure blue. We're not going to mix anything else with it, so make sure your palette and your paints are clean before you begin. And with this blue, you're going to take a nice, rich version of it and paint along the top. And with the wet paper, it is going to pull and bleed that color coming down the page. So you can add enough blue to make sure it's a nice, rich, bright color. Remember, watercolors always dry a little bit lighter. And then if you will take your brush, rinse it really well in your water, and then bring that color down the page. So just adding water is going to let that color fade coming all the way down to the bottom of the paper where it completely fades out and disappears. And this is a gradient wash. This is a really important beginner watercolor technique. So this first wash was rather light, so I'm going to add a little bit more blue and start back at the top, rinse my brush, and fade it down all the way to the bottom until it gets to just the white of the paper. Now, as soon as I have a wash that I'm happy with and I think it looks good, I'm going to take a clean paper towel and wrap it around one of my fingers until I have a nice little flat surface area and tap the top part of the page where I want to create some clouds. Now, I don't want any of these clouds to be too perfect, but we're just going to create and dab out some of that color, lifting it off the surface of the paper. So it's going to be really important that your paper is still wet when you do this. You want the top of the clouds to be nice and puffy, and then the bottom of the clouds are going to be fairly flat. So you can see the bottom of that cloud dropped down just a little bit too far, so I added a little bit more blue color and then soften that edge with my paper towel. Now once your clouds are finished, you are going to let this completely dry before you move on to the next step. Now that my painting is dry, I'm going to think about where I want the landscape to go, and I'm going to visualize the lower one-third of the page. That way my landscape can fit along the rule of thirds. So now I'm going to mix a blue-green shade on my palette, and this is going to become the mountain in the background of my painting. So around the one-third line, once I have my color mixed, I'm going to create a waving sort of up and down kind of line to represent where I want those mountain ridges to be. Now keep it fairly organic, don't make the lines too jagged, but I'm going to fill that area in, rinse my brush, and then with just water, brush along the bottom edge. And that's going to let that color fade out and give a really nice soft edge to the bottom of that first mountain range. Then let that completely dry before you move on to the next step. Now I'm going to remix that same blue-green again, but this time mix it just a little bit darker and create a second ridge line right below the first. I'll fill that area in and sort of decide how far down I want this mountain range to come. And then I'll rinse my brush again and using just water, I'm going to paint along the bottom edge of that again to sort of bleed and fade out that bottom edge. This is going to keep all those edges very soft where they sort of fade. Now once that layer completely dries, I'm now going to come back and mix an even darker green that's going to have a little bit less blue in it and be more of a standard green rather than blue green. And this time I'm going to actually add a little touch of red to help darken that color even further and make it a more natural colored green. That's going to desaturate it and darken it. 
So to create this foreground layer, I'm going to use smaller, more sort of dabbed strokes to help create the illusion that this area is closer and we might see more individual, tiny, specific trees rather than a smooth mountain range like what you see in the background. And I'll fill that area in and bring it down just a little bit, rinse my brush, and then come through and wet the bottom edge of that to let those colors fade out, giving it another soft edge. Now along this bottom edge, we're gonna create the illusion that this is the edge of a tree line, and then everything below that sort of turns into a flatter field. So I'm gonna mix an even darker green this time and add a little bit more red into it to continue desaturating it and bring a line across that bottom edge I'll rinse my brush and then again continue to soften that bottom line. This is going to give the illusion that it might be a shadowy area underneath that line of trees. Next, I'm going to mix a more of a yellow green, sort of a pure light green, and fill in the rest of the area below that edge. And I'm doing all of this while this paint is wet because that's going to let those colors bleed and sort of run into each other and everything's going to have very soft edges rather than hard and defined edges. We want this to kind of have the illusion of soft blended fields of grass and foliage. Now once I'm happy with the way that this field looks I've got enough color layered in there to where I feel like it looks realistic. Now I'm going to go back and mix another nice dark green and I'm going to create and strengthen the shadows that are underneath this ridge line of trees. So I'm just going to use some dabs and dashes to create this illusion that the top part of the trees might be getting some sunlight and then these underside of the trees are more shaded and have a darker value to them. Now once that layer has completely dried, we're going to create the trees in the foreground of our painting. We're going to create a series of evergreen trees, and for this we're going to mix the darkest color that we've made so far. So I'm going to start with a really dark, rich green, and then add a lot of red into it to really desaturate it and bring it close to a neutral there in the middle, but with maybe still just a little bit of green. Now you can decide where you want these trees to be placed and it may also be really helpful if you take a scrap piece of paper and practice this before you do it on your finished painting. But experimenting with how you can make a few vertical marks to represent the trunk of a tree and then using some dabs and dashes to create that illusion of those tree branches extending out from that trunk, creating that illusion that this is an evergreen tree. This takes a little bit of practice, and you can try it out a couple of times, experiment with different size trees, taller versus shorter ones. It's good to practice this first though, just so you can get a feel for it and kind of know what to expect. Now, once you're ready, you can begin creating these on your own painting. Now, one really good trick with these is you wanna have different heights so a really tall one and then a shorter one, a medium, and sort of vary the sizes of these trees. You also don't wanna put a tall one right in the middle of your composition because that may not be very compositionally interesting. It may sort of block off the rest of the page. So I'm gonna place my tallest tree on the left-hand side. And you also wanna make sure that as you're creating these, this should be the darkest color and the darkest value that you've used so far in this painting. And the reason for that is because of atmospheric perspective. And basically what atmospheric perspective means is that things that are closer to you have less atmosphere between you and that thing. So therefore you see it with really sharp contrast and you see the full dark values of that object. But as things recede in the distance, like those mountains, they are gonna look lighter and actually a little bit bluer because there's so much atmosphere in between you and that object. There becomes less contrast and everything becomes softened. And that's why we started out with those very light blue-green mountains in the background. Now, as you work on your trees, a great trick to help make them look really nice is you don't want your marks to be too perfect, too much the same 
every time you put your brush down on the paper, you want to create some variety and some organic types of mark making. This is what's going to create that illusion that it really feels like a realistic and organic tree. Now once I've added in all the trees that I want for this foreground of my painting, I'm going to go back in with an even darker layer of that green to add some extra contrast and create the illusion that there are shadows and even darker areas within these trees. And once I've made any final touch-ups that I want to make on my trees in the foreground, I am going to officially call this painting complete. So I want to let it completely dry and then I can very carefully peel up the tape to reveal my finished result.